Well, after dealing with two difficult parables, uh, parables back to back, last Sunday, Pastor Oyan immediately said he wanted to take one week break and asked me to preach. <laughs> At first, I didn't want to because this last week was also the first week when my master's program started the fall quarter. But then he said, today is the World Communion Sunday, and it has been a while since he led the Eucharist. So I agreed with fear and trembling, of course. <laughs> well, our text today is from Luke 17, verse 5 to 10. In today's passage, Jesus begins by comparing faith to a tiny mustard seed. But he goes on to explain that it is not how much faith you have that matters. It is how you use it. If you think this saying about faith and mustard seed sounds familiar, you're right. We also hear Jesus make this statement in the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel that we will read for most of next year. But Matthew put Jesus in a different setting than Luke does for his teaching. In Matthew, Jesus has just cast out a demon that the disciples could not do. When they ask him why they couldn't get rid of the demon, he tells them, because of your little faith. For truly, I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. But here in Luke's gospel, Jesus is answering the disciples' requests for increased faith. Jesus had just been teaching them about forgiveness and the importance of forgiving. Perhaps they realized that the kind of forgiveness Jesus was asking them to offer required more faith than they had. So they want more. Well, is that the right thing to want? Well, let's find out today. Let me read for you Luke 17, verse 5 to 10. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord replied, if you had the faith of the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, Come here at once and take your place at the table. Would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, put on your apron and serve me drink. Later, you may eat and drink. Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. Let's pray. Lord, open our ears and our hearts this morning to your word and your presence. May our hearts be fertile soil where the seed that is planted will grow, and may we be encouraged and given new life. Open our lives and the lives of our church community to your word and the way of your kingdom. Amen. If I just had more faith, if I just had more faith. I think most of us have struggled with that at some point in our lives. If I just had more faith, I wouldn't have so many questions or doubts. If I just had more faith, God would answer my prayers. If I just had more faith, she wouldn't have died. He would have recovered. If I just had more faith, I would be more involved in the church. If I just had more faith, I would be a better person, a better parent, a better spouse. If I just had more faith, I would know what to do. I would handle things better. If I just had more faith, life would be different. This is actually an approach to faith that is at least as old as the apostles' own faith. It is the approach 
they have taken in today's gospel. Increase our faith, they asked Jesus. A few verses before our reading, Jesus had just warned them not to become stumbling blocks to others. He said, it would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble. He also just told them to forgive as often as an offender repents, even if it is seven times in one day. That is not an easy command. That will be difficult to follow. It will be a challenge to live that way. So they responded with, increase our faith. It seems like a reasonable request. If a little is good, a lot must be better. If we can go to a fast food restaurant and ask for a super size menu, sorry, hang on, I lost my track of um, memo, my, my minutes, sorry. If we can go to a fast food restaurant and supersize our meal, surely Jesus can supersize our faith, right? But this request, the request to increase our faith and the belief that if I had more faith, things would be different, they actually reveal at best a misunderstanding of faith itself and at worst, a demonstration of our own unfaithfulness. Faith does not increase like magic. You probably know this already. Faith is felt and known through our life experiences. And this can only come through practice. Especially in those challenging moments when faith is put to the test. When I say test, I don't mean test in the sense that you will pass or fail. I don't think that's what Jesus means either. When our faith is put to the test, it simply means that we move forward with a concrete step in the justice-seeking and peacemaking way of Jesus with a discerning heart regardless of uncertainty, worry, or fear. That is why the writer of Hebrews said that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And I think that's why Jesus is very clear in his response. Faithfulness is neither about size nor quantity. If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, he said, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. You see, faith is not given to us like a stash of cash to be spent as currency in our dealings with God. Faith is not measured out according to how difficult the task or work before us. Faith is not a thing we have or get. Instead, faith is a relationship of trust, and faith is a relationship of love, which tells us that faith means opening ourselves opening ourselves to receive another's life and opening ourselves to giving our life to another. And that other one is Jesus Christ. That one faith relationship is what determines who we are and how we live. Faith is not about getting our facts right about what we believe. It is not about having all the data so that we can make a reasonable intellectual decision about Christianity. Decisions that are free of doubt. No, faith is not about that. In fact, doubt is part of faith. Let me say that again. Doubt is part of faith. The Trappist monk and Christian mystic Thomas Merton, in his book, New Seeds of Contemplation, said, you cannot be a person of faith unless you know how to doubt. 
Merton points out that when faith does not struggle, it is not true faith. Faith is not about giving intellectual agreement to a particular doctrine or idea. It is not about how much or how strongly we believe in Jesus' words or actions. You know, when we speak to married couples, I think some of you have heard this before, we say to them that faithfulness does not mean they believe or agree with each other's ideas all the time. Faithfulness does not mean they see eye to eye about a particular understanding of marriage. They are faithful because they have committed themselves to each other in love and trust. They are faithful because they're continually giving their life to the other and receiving the other's life as their own. They are faithful because they can carry with them that one relationship wherever they go in all that they are and all that they do. We always tell couples, even when you are out alone with your friends, your identity is so-and-so husband or so-and-so wife. So when I go out with my ladies' friends for dinner and drink, I am never just Arlene. I am Oyan's wife. And so it is with our relationship with Jesus. Faith will not, however, change the circumstances of our lives. Instead, it changes us. Living in faith does not shield us from pain and difficulties of life. I think some of you have experienced that as well. Living in faith does not undo the past. And living in faith will not guarantee a particular future. Faith is the means by which we face and deal with the circumstances of life. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. exemplified this when he described the fear that overcame him. In one of his collection of writings, he told the story of when he began receiving phone calls of death threats at night. One night, the phone call was particularly troubling, and King found himself exasperated, unable to sleep, and ready to quit. While offering a humble, desperate prayer, King says that he felt the presence of God like never before. And he said he heard this word speaking to him in the depth of his soul. Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for truth. For God will be at your side forever. As King notes, the outer situation remained the same, but God had given me inner calm. His faith doesn't guarantee a particular future. We know what happens to Martin Luther King Jr. later on. Instead, faith is the means by which he faces and deals with the circumstances of life. Our story may not be the same with King, but I believe that is also how faith works in our lives. Faith is the means by which we face and deal with the circumstances of life. Those circumstances that include the difficulties and losses, the joys and successes, the opportunities and possibilities. And faith also does not get us a pat on the back or a reward or a promotion in God's eyes. Faith is simply the way in which we live, we move, and have our being so that at the end of the day, we faithful ones can say, without pride or shame, we have done only what we ought to have done. Nothing more, and nothing less. Faith means at the end of the day, we can say we have lived in openness to Trust in and love in Christ. Faith means we have allowed Him to guide our decisions, our words, and our actions. And faith means we have been sustained by Him in both life and death. 
Faith is not, however, lived out in abstract. It is practiced day after day after day, especially in the ordinary, everyday circumstances. Some days, when the pain and heaviness of life seem more that we can carry, it is by faith and by our relationship with Jesus that we get up each morning and face the reality of life. Other days present other circumstances. When we feel the pain of the world and respond with compassion by feeding the hungry, housing the homeless, speaking for justice, when we experience the brokenness of a relationship and offer forgiveness and mercy, when we see the downtrodden and offer our presence and prayers, in all those we have lived, seen, and acted, we do it by faith. Then there are days when we feel powerless, feel lost, do not know the way forward. By faith, we sit in silence and wait. We wait for God. Faith, then, is how we live. It is the lens through which we see ourselves, we see others, and we see the world. And faith is the criterion by which we act and speak us also. Faithfulness means no matter where we go, no matter what circumstances we face, we do so with the relationship with the one who created, who loves, who sustains, and redeems us. We do so in relationship with the one who, in our second reading, is said to have abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Jesus does not supersize our faith. It is not necessary. We live by faith not because we have enough faith. We live by faith because we have faith, any faith, even a mustard seed-sized faith. That is all we need. Jesus believes that. I think we should too. The question is not how much faith we have, but rather, how are we living the faith we have? How is our faith, our relationship with Jesus, changing our lives, our relationship, and the lives of others? If it is not doing that, then more of the same will really make no difference. The mustard seed faith is already planted within us. It is Christ himself in each one of us. He has withheld nothing from us. We already have enough. We do not need more faith. We need more response to the faith, to Christ, the mustard seed, and the relationship we already have. So to close the sermon today, I will pray a prayer of unknowing by Thomas Merton. Let us all pray. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end nor do I really know myself, and the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I'm actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Amen. Amen.